At first, there were no islands. There was only the sea. Beneath the surface, volcanoes were pushing upwards until their stark cones created a Y-shaped archipelago in the great ocean. Coral grew and gathered around the extinct volcanoes, and reefs were formed. Earth movements uplifted the reefs until they too helped make and shape the islands. The Pacific is the last area on Earth that man has occupied. People first came to these islands four or five thousand years ago. Since then, they've arrived in a series of waves from different regions at different times. There was room for all, and each migration discovered enough space to build its separate community. Melanesians were settled throughout the 80 islands with their own languages, custom and culture by the time the explorers came from Europe. De Quiros, Bougainville and then Cook scattered their alien names throughout the Pacific. In 1774, Captain Cook navigated and charted all the major islands in the archipelago. He named them the New Hebrides. The era of discovery ended with Cook. The New Hebrides was on the map and by the 1860s, the whalers, the traders and the missionaries had got to all the islands of the group. Technically dominant culture had come in force to impose its will on the earlier arrivals. Traditional custom started to disintegrate. Old gods were being replaced. Although missionaries brought a confusion of competitive religion, they all came to spread the word of one god. Missionaries did everything they could to stop the blackbirding of indentured labour to the sugar plantations of Queensland and the Pacific colonies, but many died en route. Others perished at home as a long series of epidemics were introduced by the returning sugar workers, the white settlers and the missionaries themselves. The last resource was the land itself. The soil was rich, the rainfall reliable, and imported animals thrived and multiplied here. British and French planters bought large areas of land from the islanders, who had a very different concept of land ownership. For the native New Hebridean, land was not owned, so it couldn't be sold. Only the right to use the land and take the things it grew. One white speculator was able to acquire about one-twelfth of the total land area of the New Hebrides in only two weeks.
France saw the New Hebrides as an ideal home for liberated convicts who'd served their time in New Caledonian jails. Britain was anxious to prevent France from taking possession of the group, although she was unwilling to assume the responsibility herself. Proposals, gunboat diplomacy, missionary agitation in Australia and counter-proposals led to an extraordinary compromise. In 1887, France and Britain set up a joint naval commission to safeguard order in the New Hebrides. Although the compromise was impossible to implement, it staggered along for 20 years until being replaced by an Anglo-French condominium, which was charged with the joint administration of the New Hebrides. Vila became the administrative centre, as well as the commercial capital, when the condominium began governing in 1906. The town grew as the governments expanded. The last British resident commissioner, Andrew Stewart, inherited the results of a tradition of over 70 years of condominium rule. Technically, the country was never a colony, it was a region of joint influence over which neither Britain nor France had any territorial sovereignty. Inspector General Robert, the last French resident commissioner, shared the responsibility of maintaining this unique form of government, of making the unworkable work. There were three forms of government. The first, a joint administration, was headed equally by both resident commissioners, and it provided most of the usual functions of government. Two other quite separate administrations protected French and British interests. Each had its own police force, prisons and courts for their own nationals. They also provided care and education, as far as New Hebrideans were concerned, the churches were the only effective administration. The great majority, the Protestants, looked to the British in their areas and the Catholics to the French. Divisions were created as the people became influenced by the church of their allegiance, the administration that governed them and especially by the school system that operated in their district. Many islanders are trilingual, speaking their own local language, either French or English, and Bishlamar. Through the dual education system, they absorb not only another language, but either the French or British culture and bias that controlled their society. Both linguistic and political divisions were growing among New Hebrideans. New words had to be invented to describe people who, in their own land, were not black Frenchmen or black Englishmen, they were Francophone and Anglophone. It 
was the Protestant and later the Catholic school systems which would produce a New Hebridean educated elite. By the 1940s, the Protestants were encouraging Melanesians to become church and social leaders. From this background would emerge the future political leaders of the country. In 1942, the easy-going isolation of the islands came to an end, especially in Espiritu Santo. A hundred thousand United States troops were permanently stationed here until the war ended in 1945. Santo's main town changed almost overnight as a spectacular war machine turned a sleepy little European settlement into a massive forward military base. Half a million US troops went on from here to fight the Japanese in the north. James Michener wrote Tales of the South Pacific about Santo and John F. Kennedy skippered his patrol torpedo boat from what is now just a long wreck of broken concrete and twisted steel. The end of the war was the start of the decline of colonial influence. New Hebridean political aspirations didn't cause any real impact until 1971, when Americans were buying up large areas of land here. The land issue caused Jimmy Stevens' Nagrelmel movement in Santo to present a petition to the United Nations, and quite separately, the first political party was formed. Political parties quickly developed under the banners of the return of land, unity and independence. France and Britain were forced to agree to a representative assembly and elections followed. Lemon. Abstention. Lini. Lini. In November 1979, the Vanuatu party, on a platform of early independence, gained a two-thirds majority in the national representative elections. Votes are being counted now to elect a chief minister. Nomination for chief minister, Leimang three, abstention three, Lini 26. As chairman of this assembly, I declare that Father Walter Lini had been elected as new chief minister for the new Hebrides government. Vanuaku's resounding victory was no surprise, but they also won, by a narrow margin, the regional elections held on the islands of Santo and Tana. The opposition was surprised and shocked by this. They'd expected a clear majority. I, Walter Hedy Linney. The regional election results set the scene for the hostilities to come. It was to be a troubled eight months before Father Walter Leaney was to lead the country to independence. Being duly elected chief minister, swear by Almighty God that I will faithfully carry out the duties of my office and serve the people of the New Hebrides without partiality, fear or favour. So help me God. The defeat in the regional elections brought about immediate opposition, frustration and anger in Santo and Tana. Jimmy Stevens led his Nagrimal Bushmen into the streets to threaten government supporters who were from other islands. The message was clear. You're foreigners. Leave Santo. Go back home or else. Standover tactics were used in Tanner as well. Trouble flared up again in February when Jimmy Stevens renamed Santo as the Republic of Vemirana and declared its separate independence. The following month, the government named the date of New Hebrides independence as July 30th, 1980. There were the usual delays before it was ratified, first by the British and later, with extreme reluctance, by the French. Independence was now a reality and acted as a catalyst for the dissidents who struck again in late May. Order was restored in Tanna by the British Police Mobile Unit, but this time a well-organised and well-armed group of Santo residents mainly French citizens, allied with Jimmy Stevens, determined to force the separation of Santo. There was plenty of help and encouragement from outside the New Hebrides. The American-based Phoenix Foundation invested at least a quarter of a million dollars to supply Vemirana with a pirate radio and even its own passports, coinage and constitution.
And we said, after election on 1979, we want to tell you too that Santo must be on Man Santo's hand. It means Santo must be staying in our custom. We vote, but doesn't matter who win the election. But we said, you go to Villa. Election for us, it's for Villa, because it's white man, white man material. But we say we stay in the custom. We want to stay under our custom. Santo, with all the island around Santo, must be stay with Nagriamel. And on 28, custom said, no, it's a time now. We give three time warning, nothing done. We take back our, our property down where the Walter Linnis government is. On May 28th, Jimmy Stevens declared himself president of Vemarana. Santo Town was firmly in rebel hands, and only the French government facilities and police were unaffected by the secessionists. They took Santo's airport and captured the district commissioner with some of his police and officials. Government employees were terrorized, their homes and offices sacked, the British prison emptied, and English language schools closed. Six, four, five, four. Rebels soon controlled all New Hebrides government services, the post office, radio, and all forms of transport. Even the old American wartime airstrips were permanently blocked and patrolled against possible retaliation. The government declared a total blockade on Santo for all aircraft, shipping, and communications. Over two and a half thousand people were evacuated from Santo by the New Hebrides and British governments. For some, it had been the second time in less than a year that they'd left their homes, possessions and animals behind. Britain and France were still responsible for law and order up to independence, but even so, the New Hebrides government made several attempts to negotiate. Most of their efforts even to meet the rebels were rejected, and the chief negotiators, Barak Sopi and Salam Melissa, were turned back several times. As long, um, we have been trying to land at the airport on Santo. Before we left, we had received word that they would give an answer at 2 o'clock for us to land. We went and flew over Santo for about half an hour. We asked for permission three or four times, but the reply we received was negative. At first, there were about three trucks blocking the runway. Then later, another ten trucks joined them. We repeated our request to land, but they said no. We will try again through the radio to contact Jimmy direct. If he wants to talk, as far as the government is concerned, we are willing to sit down. If they don't want to meet us, that's their business. But as far as the government is concerned, we would like to try again. Eighteen days after the secession, 200 British Marines landed here. They went to leave Vila for over five weeks. A few days before, the French flew in their guard mobile. They stayed in Vila as well, then 27 hours later went home to Noumea. By intention or not, the effect was to demonstrate how quickly the French could mobilize a show of force. After all, New Caledonia is only an hour or so away by air. And for the British, it was a big operation to airlift troops from the United Kingdom to the New Hebrides. in most places, life seemed to go on as normal. Tourists wandered around, did their shopping, and tried out their new cameras over a drink at the Rossi. They visited the market, then went back to their cruise ships, wondering what the fuss was about. The New Hebrides now had a new name, Vanuatu, and the latest songs were all about independence. It was getting closer every day. 
40,000 uh, low Vanatu fly. More, he got uh, 15,000 no British, more 15,000 no French fly. We all get a fly here now, but my if you use him, lo send him go all get a island, lo every island where we ask him we lo use him lo independent state. Only look nice. Oh yes, only nice plus. He got all get a t-shirt here where every size inside, small. He got 10 inch lo one cut on it. I think he may buy enough for you, yeah, Charlo. Um, well, t-shirt here he. Everyone in white color, no more. And I uh, got small size, well, big. Can you buy enough for you, yeah? I think my tram. Maybe I may also be a big one too much, yeah? I think a big one too much. I think my tram another one. Lucky look nice. Two independent celebration teams are traveling throughout Vanuatu to try to reach every population center throughout the islands. Messages are sent ahead by Radio Vanuatu for village leaders to come together to meet the teams, to ask questions and decide who will go to Vila to represent them and where and how they will celebrate Independence Week in their own communities. David Tanarango heads the northern team. He's an Anglophone and his colleague is Francophone. Together they can give everyone the chance to learn about independence, to see and understand the significance of their flag, hear their anthem and know the meaning of their country's new name. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, me, Chief Silas, when we look out from Brazil, long district here, me happy Thomas, long where you come. Some villages have already decided amongst themselves the centres where they will celebrate. They've started to clear a site and buildings are going up to house visitors who will come from all the neighbouring villages. I have come in the name of the government and want to hold a meeting with you. I want to talk about our independence. Our independence is coming closer. I don't represent the French government, the British government or the Vanuatu government. I have come to talk to you about our independence how we will celebrate independence and how independence will affect you. How Pambay celebration blow independence blow me go and also them now Pambay independence here me come. So any any more questions that you ask about politics, I will not be able to speak on it. I'm very sorry, I cannot answer any questions about politics. Tabia Kalsakau leads the southern independence team. They're going to Fortuna where there are no airstrips and it's too far to reach by speedboat. The only way to get there is by ship. The population's small and representatives have come from Fortuna's six villages to meet the ship and talk about the celebrations. <laughs> 